when faced with your life challenges. Have you ever wondered why it is that two people can face the same circumstances in life and one of them stay focused and overcome their adversity while the other person's life will descend into chaos and negativity? This same scenario occurs when two people are trying to make lifestyle and diet changes. While one person will stick to their weight and health goals, another at the first hurdle will give up and state that it was too hard or life got in the way. What is the difference between these two people? The difference is simply how they perceive their circumstances. We create meaning and act accordingly to how we perceive the world around us. We do not see the world as it is. We see the world as we are. Do you stay positive in face of your life challenges or are your first thoughts, why me? If you stay positive and you can overcome and grow through your life challenges and stick to your weight and health goals. If you are on the other hand, the type of person that says why me and feels the world is against you, more often than not, you may give up at the slightest setback. The great thing is people can alter their lives by altering their attitude of mind. What do you do to improve and strengthen your mind? Welcome and good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure that you're joining me on this snowy, this snowy Sunday afternoon in England. If you're joining me from overseas in America or wherever you're joining for welcome, I know it might be about nine o'clock or even earlier for some of you. If you're on, I think it's CT time, it might be seven o'clock because I know there's some international listeners. So really appreciate you taking the time to join. I hope that today's show will be able to take away some of those snow blues that sometimes it happens. I have a great show. I'm really, really excited uh, about today and my guest that I have because, do you know, it's about gut health and it's going to be so interesting you know our gut affects us in so many ways and so many people suffer from bloating and you know they may even suffer from that you know that bit of a smelly stuff you, you know what i'm talking about come on come on we've all been through a time and and some people are a little bit worse than others but if that is the case with you we have the remedy for you today all right so listen i'm going to come back in a minute and we're going to say hellos but i want to tell you Today, I am so grateful and so wonderful that you have joined me on the Make Health Your Habit Show. Yes, yes, if you suffer from that kind of bloated or that smelly stuff, we can, we are going to help you today. But firstly, it's great to say hello. If you're watching us on YouTube, if you're watching us on Facebook, say hello. Let me just say hello to Mr. P, DJ Mr. P. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for your always your support. And Isaiah, great, Dr. Isaiah, I know it's morning where you are because you're calling from the USA. So I, I don't know if it's snowing where you are. I heard it was snowing. I don't know if it is still snowing, but it's definitely snowing here. Thank you very much for your continued support, Isaiah. And look, if there's anybody out there on YouTube, just use the message, uh, the message section on Facebook, just to say hello. It's important that you get, you learn how to use that because when Dr. Megan comes on, you may have a question and sh we are here to answer your questions. We're here to add value. So just get used to typing away and and, and saying hello, because today's subject is incredibly important. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Ken Barnes. I'm known as the Lean Mind Body Coach. What do I do? Well, I've written a book called The, Sci the, the Lean Mind Body Method, The Science of Getting Lean, Fit, and Healthy. And what that book does, it documents how I lost 50 pounds in six months, reversed my pre-diabetes, and cured my sleep apnea. 
and I specialize in reversing pre-diabetes and diabetes and weight loss and I've got some special announcement for you today. So that's what I do and there's the book on the screen, The Lean My Body Method and I just love it, I'm incredibly passionate and this shows Make Your Health the Habit or Make Health Your Habit I should say and you know I don't just focus on my methodology which is low carb, I encompass everything. Now we've had a few more people say hello so good morning or good afternoon I think it's it's Fatima, Good. Uh, yes e Evelyn from South Africa. Oh wow, we truly have an international audience today. So England, America and South Africa. Good, I don't know what time it is there, so I'll say hi Evelyn. Thank you very much for taking the time to say hello. Really, listen, while we're having the show, you can interact and talk within yourselves in the chat because, and the questions, I will, inter I will try and get to some of them in the show, but at the end, you will definitely have a chance. I want to add value to you. And Megan, Dr. Megan wants to head, add value to you today because, you know, I have some personal questions that I really want to ask. So listen, you know, without any further ado, let me just, I'll tell, let me just tell you a little bit about Dr. Megan because really, so Dr. Megan is a licensed naturopathic doctor in the state of Vermont. She has a private practice in Stockbridge, GA, and is a member of the African Association for Neuropathic Physicians. She specializes in digestive systems. But you know what? I think it's about time, let me bring her up, and I think she can tell you a little bit more about herself more than me. Dr. Megan, how are you Hello. this morning? Because I know it's morning where you are, you're in the USA. Yes. How are you this morning? I'm in Atlanta, so yes, my name. I'm doing well, Mr. Ken. How are you? Oh, <laughs> good. You call me Mr. Ken, Mr. Ken. Oh, yes. excellent. So, Megan, listen, I am going to, I just want you to sh share with the audience who's listening at the moment. Just introduce yourself and tell them a little bit about yourself, and then we'll come back and we'll have a, a discussion about gut health. Um. That's fun. Yeah, sure. Okay, guys. Hey, good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening, wherever you're listening in the world. Uh, my name's Dr. Megan. Yeah, originally I'm from France, actually, but we did uh, move here to the States when I was little. So I did grow up here in Atlanta, where I still am now. Um, I do have both of my parents are still living, which is a blessing. I also have two siblings, an older sister and an older brother, and they both have children as well. Yeah, otherwise, I always knew I wanted to be a doctor ever since I was like 10 years old. I don't know why, really, because I wasn't like ever sickly as a child, and we don't have any other doctors in my family. So I don't know, but I guess it's just something in my spirit. And so, yeah, so I did a bio, I was a biology major in college, and then the, um, my minor was chemistry, but then the uh, pre-med was my uh, concentration. Yeah, and originally my path was a little bit I guess torrid, you would say, just because I didn't go directly there. I did do interviews at other medical schools, and they basically just either mocked the idea of natural healing or um, just really didn't think that um, it would work. And, and, and I knew it would because I'd lived it personally. You know, I had been diagnosed with lupus when I was 24, and I had done like a natural cleansing program. They healed it almost all the way. So, and I, I'd had a lot of edema, I could not pee anymore, my kidneys were attacked. So, but I had already gone through that experience at that time anyway, and just seeing the beautiful power of nature healing. And so once I went to those interviews and saw their skepticism, and I don't believe that once you're sick, you're always sick. I do believe you can heal. And from any disease, I've seen people from cancer, diabetes, I mean, you name it. So I didn't espouse that idea. And I don't really care for using drugs unnecessarily. I think they do have their place, but not long term. And so um, I said, no, that's not for me. So finally, I did see the um, naturopathic.org. That's where you can go and look for a nature, national naturopathic database for in the U.S. anyway. And so then I saw their schools and that was it. I was gone. <laughs> Absolutely fantastic. Uh, I, I, I love that. And, you know, I love your energy. I really, really do. I absolutely love you. But I think you are, there's part of your introduction that you missed out, which I think people will find incredibly inspiring. Okay. I know that you had um, 
an illness that has affected you, but you've managed to rise above that. I think it would be appropriate to share that because I think it will be inspiring some people, um, definitely in the audience. I know some people just join. Hello, baby. Hello, Janet. Thank you very much. I know that's going to be inspiring. So please just share your the journey, the travesty that you had to overcome. Absolutely. Well, guys, what happened was, um, okay, like I told you, I've always wanted to be a doctor. And so um, when I was like 23 or 24, when I was still in university, this group came to the um, school and said that there were, um, that if we were interested, we could um, apply to a medical school in Cuba and that we actually would not owe all the like 250,000 plus dollars of medical school loans if we went to school here in the US because the Cuban government would absorb the cost. And we can even come back here and practice in the US. They have enough Cuban doctors, but they're just doing this because they're a very humanitarian society. And so I said, this sounds great. Plus I'll be trilingual. Y'all know French is already my native language. And then of course I speak English, but I said, okay, then I'll learn Spanish too. So, and then I'll be a doctor just like one. But guys, two days before I went there, I just blew up. I could not wake, open my eyes one morning because I just, well, originally I thought that I just was tired because obviously I was working as a waitress, getting up at like five o'clock to be at work at six and all that. I thought I was just tired when I was trying to open my eyes. But what I realized when I got to the bathroom is my eyelids were so swollen that they were weighing down on my eyes. That's why I couldn't open them. My nose was swollen. My lips were swollen. Guys, I look like an alien. And I really scared myself looking in the mirror. But then fortunately, it went down enough. So when I got to work, I wasn't as swollen. But then I noticed during the rest of the day that I started just feeling odd in my body. And then when I looked down at my feet, guys, my ankles had actually swollen over my shoes. So and my legs were rubbing together. And, I, and my stomach was huge. So what happened was when I got home, I told my dad about this and he was asking, what did I eat? Because he thought maybe it was a food reaction. And I had been at my friend's house the night before and I'd eaten salmon. And at that time I really wasn't eating much fish. So I thought, okay, maybe that was it. Fast forward two days, I'm gonna leave for Cuba in two days. I did not have time to go to the hospital. I was trying to get all the things, preparations I needed to go to Cuba, a place I'd never been, and I was gonna stay there a year before I came back home. So I'm trying to get my glasses prescription, just all that kind of stuff. I don't have time to go to the hospital, but I had gone earlier to the hospital and seen that um, they had seen a lot of protein in my urine, which is abnormal. It was three plus, normal should be like less than plus one, right? And so I, again, I did not have a doctor, I could not follow up, got to Cuba. It was so hard for me to walk by that time because I was so, swollen okay it just very swollen through my legs it would go down at night but come back up during the day so then finally after being at the school i told them immediately so then they had me measure my urine by carrying like a little bucket you know all day that's when i started realizing that i was no longer urinating guys it's like 80 degrees down it's like april but it's still hot because it's cuba and i'm drinking water i'm drinking like eight ten cups of water a day but i'm now not urinating at all i just had carry an empty bucket all day. So then I knew this was a problem. So finally, after about three days, they said, this is pretty serious. We think we need to send you into one of the main hospitals in Havana so that you can be checked out. I went there. I thought I was just going there for a day or two, guys. I was admitted for a month, okay? Finally, they came back with that diagnosis of um, lupus, systemic lupus. Guys, there's two types, discoid and systemic. The discoid type, mainly affects your exterior, meaning your face, but the systemic type is the more dangerous. It can affect your organs. The most common organ is the kidney, but it can affect any organ, your brain, anything. So um, that's why that had attacked my kidneys and stopped me from urinating. So now I'm literally, guys, I have what I call like a camel hump. I had water everywhere. I had like a bump in my back, like I said, camel hump because it's just water just building up everywhere, exacerbated by gravity, obviously. So during the day, it's worse. So then anyway, they told me that's a disease that you, is incurable. You'll have it forever. And so I was devastated, obviously. And so I was only 24. And so they said, you cannot stay here. You have to go back to the States. 
because you have to have treatment for this, which is very rigorous the first year, and you have to be followed by a nephrologist. So I came back to the States, and um, I did see a nephrologist who basically you know, scared me to death about all the side effects, which are, by the way, um, osteoporosis, meaning a weakening of your bones, so you can break your bones very easily. I would also have a depressed immune system because of the treatments, meaning I could get a cold or flu very easily, other illnesses. Another side effect was hair loss. And guys, y'all know I did not want to lose my hair. I know that's pain, but I did not want to be bald, okay? So hair loss, okay? And the worst symptom is leukemia. That is a cancer as a side effect of the treatment. And I was just considering that. I just can't believe that the treatment is actually sounding worse than the disease. So that's when my dad pulled me aside and said, Megan, there's your way and then there's God's way. He said, you can do this way and if you want to, we will support you. But if you, I think I found another way I want you to consider. So he introduced me to a, a naturopathic doctor and herbalist that I love. His name is Dr. Schultz, Richard Schultz. He has a website, herbdoc.com, H-E-R-B-D-O-C.com. So on there, he has a bunch of different products, but the main thing that was of interest to me was his incurables program. That's a detox and cleansing program where in 30 days you do not eat. You're only drinking his herbal teas, water, and vegetable juices that you are juicing yourself. Plus, in addition to that, well, that's if you do the advanced level, no drinking. If you do the basic um, you can still eat, but just no junk, no fast food, fried food, junk food. Okay, intermediate is just raw foods or steam, and then advanced is no eating. But since I was already diagnosed, I felt I should just do the advanced. In addition to that, you're also doing um, a lot of home therapies, things like alternating hydrotherapy in the shower, meaning hot water a few minutes, as hot as you can stand it, and then cold water a few seconds. The cold is the healing part. Cold takes away toxins in the area, meaning... In the real life, this would be like the trash man who comes and takes your trash away from your house. We like that, right? And so the hot water does the opposite. It brings blood to the area, bringing vitamins and minerals. So in the real life, again, this is like the pizza delivery guy bringing us our pizza. We want pizza. We're hungry. We love pizza, right? So that's what the hydrotherapy is doing. He had me doing the castor oil cloth, which is also an analgesic topically, as well as a circulatory stimulant. So it's good for things like constipation, for pain with like arthritis, um, gout, a back pain from muscle spasm, cancer pain. So he had me doing that. He also had me um, doing enemas, getting the trash out more from pooping, okay? I had to do positive affirmations, um, get outside in sunshine, fresh air, walk on grass, releasing free radicals. So anyway, guys, I did that program. For 30 days it was very difficult because y'all know i love to eat <laughs> anyway so i almost convinced myself that like squashing up a banana and putting it in the water wasn't really eating but y'all know that is eating right <laughs> anyway but i didn't do it so now after the 30 days i noticed that all of my almost all of my markers that were originally in the negative or in the red area meaning bad either too high or too low they all went back to normal in fact guys my edema stopped everything stopped the only thing I still had was um, my thyroid markers were still not that good. So, but I was not working with a doctor. That is to my detriment, I believe, long term. So, but I still thought, great, I've done most of this. So now, fast forward, I go to med school. Fast forward from there, I finish med school. Okay, I start my practice. Very stressful, obviously, but I love it. I've seen tons of people heal from amazing things. Okay, but then... I start noticing in 2018 that my blood pressure was going up. And guys, remember, if you're in the U.S., a normal blood pressure would be less than 120 over 80, less than 120 over 80. But then mine was 170 over 110, which is extremely high. I mean, by the time we get 180 over 100, that's what we call crisis a hypertensive crisis, meaning we send them directly to the hospital because we're afraid they may have a stroke or heart attack, which... That was one thing already. In addition, um, so really it was the lupus coming back and attacking my kidneys, which do regulate your blood pressure too, just like your heart. Okay, so that was that. Then the lupus attacked my thyroid. So the thyroid is very, very, he's little, but he's very important in the body. He send receptors to your brain, to your heart, to your gut, and even to the reproductive system in women. And so when he attacked my thyroid, that gave me hypothyroid, which... Um, when you have hypothyroid, that gives you high cholesterol. 
So now, guys, if you're counting, I already have lupus, which makes me very likely to have blood clots. I already have now high blood pressure as well. Now high cholesterol. So just like they say in baseball, if y'all are baseball fans, three strikes and you are out. So my body only took that abuse for about seven months. And then in April of 2020, I actually ended up having a few rare strokes. Okay, rare because most people usually have a stroke in one area of their brain and whatever that area is, that's the function that's affected. But mine was rare because I had multiple strokes, guys, all over, all over my brain, five different areas. One area was the pond region, the midbrain. Okay, not only that, I also had concurrently at the same time, I had gotten a lung infection with pseudomonas, which is a bacteria. So I was coughing. They originally thought I had COVID, but it wasn't that. It was a lung infection. So then I also got a GI bleed at some point, meaning in my digestive system, I started bleeding and they didn't know why. Okay, I stopped breathing on my own, guys. I had to have an endotracheal tube to keep me alive. So basically, I was so sick and they had tried to resuscitate me. I had to be put on dialysis, guys. <laughs> my kidneys stopped working. They really were so sure that my death was imminent that they actually allowed my parents to come and visit me in the hospital, which they only do with end death, end of life situation, um, meaning they thought for sure I was gonna die. They wanted to put me in hospice. So they let my parents come. I remember seeing my parents. I did not know that I was supposed to be dying, but I remember seeing them. I could not talk to my endotracheal tube, but I remember they came and I did enjoy that visit. But guys, I did not die, thank goodness. I did survive. I did stay total six weeks in the hospital. I only remember four, five of them because I was so out of it the other five weeks. I remember the last week waking up in June. I went to the hospital in April and I woke up in June and I was worried I wouldn't be able to eat <laughs> for my birthday because <laughs> my birthday is June the 9th. Guys, y'all know I love cake. I love it. It's not good for you, but I love it. I love cake. Do you, so do you know, Dr. Like, Dr. Megan, I think that's an yeah. excellent story. And I know you're so passionate and and I, I really, really feel a little bit terrible to interrupting you in that story because no, okay. I heard it. But, you know, what was great about that story that you were sharing with us is it reinforced naturopathic remedies. Yes. It really did. And we've had one person ask what the website is and we can deal with that at the end. But even though you were sharing your story, that story clearly illustrated how natural remedies can heal. And we're going to be speaking about those some, some, some natural remedies. But okay. also, your story is inspiring because Luke Person or the, on the stroke, and I know, and for those of you who are watching, Dr. Megan is bedridden. She is yeah. bedridden. Yeah, she cannot get out of bed. Yeah, so I'm that's paralyzed kind of, now because she's of the paralyzed. Strokes. So she's yeah. paralyzed from the stroke. And I just wanted her to share that with you because I think the energy and the enthusiasm you have is a testament mm -hmm. to anybody who's gone through adversity. That's why I thought it was incredibly important. So, Dr. Megan, we're going to come on to some of the smelly stuff now. Not just okay. yet. All right. Okay. Why is gut health important? Tell us why. Because for me, before I understood it about health, you know, I might think brain health is important. Physical yeah. health is important. But why is gut health and why should anybody watching this take their gut health seriously? Okay, I'm going to try to be real succinct, Mr. Ken. Guys, yes, brain health is important in the body. But let's face it, your gut is what is feeding the rest of your body. Literally, whatever you eat and drink and that you are able to digest and then absorb and assimilate, that is what is feeding your heart, your lungs, your brain, your um reproductive system, your kidneys, your and your GI is even feeding itself. So that's why it's important. I always say to everyone, health and disease begins in the gut because you are what you eat and are able to assimilate. Okay. And if you cannot digest it, then that is eventually going to become what we call toxemia, meaning toxins building up in your blood and will cause disease. Whether that's an autoimmune disease, cancer, stroke, heart attack, diabetes, doesn't matter. You will get a disease if you have gut imbalance of any kind. So that's why you need to make sure that your gut is healthy. It's not if, but now when, if that gut is unhealthy. Yeah, that, that was a great um, explanation. So tell us, what is what the, the term gut microbiome, what is that? Basically, guys, in your gut, you have a bunch of bacteria that are beneficial, right? Because remember, we have three different kinds of bacteria. Beneficial that do you good, commensals, 
which are neither really good or bad, but if they overgrow, they could be bad. And then you have just outright pathogenic, meaning they're always bad. Things like Klebsiella, E. coli, those are never good for you. So basically the microbiome is that we have over 20 billion of these bacteria and they have two functions. They're mainly in your colon or large intestine, but their function is one, to help you with your digestion, to break down the food you're eating. The second function is to stimulate your immune system, which you can think of as I call in the US anyway, the, in the United States of you. So put your name there, I'm the United States of Megan. So my immune system is like my internal air force, my military, the Marines, they do the water, the Navy, all the Marines are not in the water, sorry, they're on land, the Navy, okay, and my local police. That's your immune system, your internal defense. So it because because the, the term bio microbiome sounds like it's something bad. So no, is it's uh, so it's something good. So how how is it that we live our lives that we turn against ourselves, or do we turn against ourselves? What is it that what is first of all, what is it that we do that upsets that de delicate uh, balance. And when we upset that de delicate balance, what happens in our gut? Yes, in general, actually, let me get my cell phone real quick because I already made a list of some of the things. I'm trying to remember them offhand, but I don't want to miss anything. But one of the major things that we can do to upset our health is obviously through nutrition. And guys, you cannot, everyone cannot eat the same thing. And I don't even mean just not eating junk. I mean, literally, if we do a food intolerance test like Dr. Carroll's, People could be alert, meaning not be able to digest fruit, guys, fruit. You're thinking, oh, what? An apple a day keeps the doctor away. No. So that could be bad if that's your intolerance. But the second thing we could do is even just the rest of our lifestyle. If we have high stress because we don't like ourselves, we don't like our jobs, our parents hate us, that could be it. It could be environmental toxicities, things like mercury in our dental fillings. Every time you bite down, you're releasing elemental mercury into your brain. Mercury is a neurotoxin, okay? You could even have things like um, just other things, like this one girl, she was from the Ukraine and she lived through that Chernobyl nuclear power uh, disaster. So she actually was very toxic from that. So it could be that cadmium things. Okay, if it's not that, it could be poor sleep. It could be, but in general, you and it can, it can be mental, emotional things. Maybe you're abused as a child. So in general, there's other things, car accidents do and any other kind of physical accident. But in general, those are the, and then just microbes like an overabundance of whatever, E. coli, like I said, uh, pseudomonas, eclipsia, all of those major things there, they either can be one big insult or then it could be an accumulation through your life of insults, which will then tip over your toxic bot, birdie bot, um, bucket, as I like to call it. That will tip over, just like filling up a cup too much with water. It will spill over eventually, guys. And again, then what you call the disease doesn't matter. At that point, the idea is that you've come out of balance with nature's nine health laws. You now need to get back in balance if you plan to heal. I, I, yeah, I definitely want to hear what nature's nine health laws are. Oh, good. In, in a <laughs> but so it's interesting what you said, and I, I never realized you're saying that someone who suffered stress or maybe post-traumatic stress as a as a as a child that can affect their gut biome microbiome as an adult uh, absolutely that was really and interesting even tell you personally from my story i didn't add this in but i believe my lupus developed because guys ever since i was five years old i became constipated and mm. constipation okay. we have two definitions yeah it's either your poop is very hard right like either hard like a log or like a bunch of little round rabbit pellets. And I like rabbits, but I don't like rabbit pellet poop, okay? <laughs> but yes. now, the other thing is that, too, you could still be pooping daily, but if it's still you're straining and stuff, that's still constipation, okay? So, so, so just at this point, because you did mention poop, you know, um, we'll, we'll talk about the bloating afterwards. I mean, I think it's yeah. incredibly important every time you go to toilet to look behind you and see what state your poop is in. Um, why is that important for people to do? Well, first of all, because you can see a lot from your poop. Even though people don't think you can, you can. You should already know, basically, if you're sitting in the bathroom with a book or a magazine like I used to do, guys, I used to be in there for three hours and I didn't only poop to once a month. That's ridiculous. OK, so if you're taking that long to poop, that already is a problem. Also, though, your poop color can tell you things. If your poop is yellow, that's a sign of liver disease. That's horrible because liver is very important in the body. If he's sick, you, there's no question you're going to get a disease. Also, the smell, the odor, it should not smell like flowers. We know poop is waste. 
but it shouldn't smell like death either. So the smell can tell you. Also, when you're looking at the appearance, if you think see things in your food, in your poop, like food, you should not see whole food in there, like corn. But we all know corn is horrible. People usually can't digest that. So if you see it though, that's another sign that you are not doing well. So yes, guys, please look at your poop. <laughs> how how about on the last thing? How about the 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 consistency of the poop? Does that does that tell us anything? Yes, it does. Well, it's solid. Your poop is too hard. You're probably not getting either enough water or fiber. Okay, fiber meaning insoluble fiber. Things like cereals, like wheat, um, green veggies like kale and broccoli and and uh, stuff like that. Okay, if it's too soft, that's not good either. That's diarrhea. So some people just literally pee out of their butt. Okay, so that's too soft, meaning that could be an infection actually, or again, not enough. Um, maybe too much fiber now, not enough balance of the probiotics and the beneficial bacteria. One more poop question. What about if they see specks yeah. of blood in their poop? Should that they be horrible. concerned? Yes, absolutely. They should be concerned. Blood in your poop usually means you've got a GI bleed. And the darker the blood lets us indicate where it could have come, meaning your dark blood may have started up higher in your GI, meaning maybe in your esophagus or like in your stomach. And by the time it worked its way down into your poop, it's, you know, blood should turn dark, dark red after a long time. So that would be a sign of an upper GI bleed, okay? Now, bright blood would be a lower GI bleed, maybe from a hemorrhoid. And remember guys, you get hemorrhoids usually from constipation, sometimes with pregnancy, but mainly you're putting pressure on those capillaries around your rectum, then you can maybe start bleeding like that. So, so any, any poop, just, you know, just be, con just monitor that and be concerned. So that was, Always. that was the, that was the poop talk that we had. Yeah, so you, you, I love you, talking about poop. <laughs> you said something really interesting, which brings you back to this coronavirus times. You said that um, stress and, you know, traumatic stress um, years ago could affect your gut microbiome. So what does that leave? How does that leave us this coronavirus period when we have had this lockdown, where we've had this fearful time, people are under a lot more stress. Um, there's been a lot more mental... Um, strain on people does that mean there's going to be potentially during this people this this period that people's um gut are going to start playing up absolutely you know they've done studies mr ken about how stress and and other negative emotions like fear anxiety can decrease your microbe biome and it can guys it can actually make you sicker meaning again they're the ones they're your immune system your rv navy Marines, Air Force, Navy, uh, all that. So the fact of the matter is we've done studies where an emotion, just take anger. We're not even talking about stress and corona, right? Just take anger, guys. Let's say you're just always angry for whatever reason. They say that anger can actually diminish your immune system function by four to six hours. Just 10 minutes of anger, like just being in traffic in the morning and like, why would these stupid people boop? You know, like that. Guys, four to six hours. Imagine what that means. If you can't get it in the medical sense, I will give you a lifetime application, lifestyle, okay? Imagine giving your local police the, the day off, meaning you give them four to six hours off. That means your neighbor can beat you up, random people on the street can come in, steal from you, kill your wife, any take your car. This is what it means when you decrease your immune system and any emotion negative that is sustained is like that. The body really does like it to be a seesaw meaning you go up a little bit and then down a little bit. Seesaw, it does not like a roller coaster where you're flying up and then you're crashing down. No, keep seesaw. So negative emotions absolutely will do that. Okay, that, that is really interesting, especially in the time we're in um, to know that stress. And that's why I think this show is even more pertinent and important considering what people are going through. So here's a question, look, We've all been in a room, a family room, and it's like, who did it? Who did it? It, it, it wasn't me. It wasn't me. It was you. It was you. You know what I'm talking about. It's that sneaky little wind that people never end up, own up to. And, it, and it's always the smelliest one. It's Why does that happen? What What is that about our gut that makes that happen? Well, actually, I mean, if you're talking about the like smell from like farting or fluffing, as I like to call it, um, basically, that's just, as you're, um, you're, um, 
beneficial bacteria. They're breaking down your food, right? And remember, our body loves to recycle. Just like we like to recycle plastic and metal and stuff, it will always recycle things. The main organ that does that is the kidney. He recycles things like calcium, sodium, glucose, you know, all these things, right? And, and he puts it back into our body. So technically, when it's in the GI, it comes out of our body for a second, he puts it back into the bloodstream, okay? So basically, and then so we keep everything that's good. Everything that bad, we take it to the colon or large intestine. The fact of the matter is, though, that as it's breaking all these things down, metabolism, yeah, metabolizing it, um, eventually everything that's waste is, is thrown away. And waste, unfortunately, tends to stick. Like, that's why I call it waste. <laughs> but yeah, so even if you're fluffing, you can actually tell by the smell of your farting if you are very sick or not. Because if your farting smells like death, like you're killing flowers in your wake or whatever. I, <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Sorry, I love that. Okay. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. I don't care. I'm telling you guys, it should not smell that bad. My dad he farts all the time. This is a game to always doing. But his dad, no older guys, that's because his GI is pretty good. So that bad smell and fart should be an indication. Let me get my GI together. <laughs> So, 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 ladies and gentlemen, if you're watching this, <laughs> your partner, death, death, way past weird, and it smells like death. Look, <laughs> they need to sort themselves out. I mean, yeah. that, that, that doesn't seem like a, a great experience. Okay, so listen, we spoke about the poop and we spoke about the smelly stuff. Let's just talk about some practical things that happen. Yeah. Bloating. Um, you see, often some people are bloated after a meal they 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 sometimes they can't even eat a lot or even if they do eat they feel this bloated heavy feeling after a meal what's actually happening there that could be a few things to be honest because like that's a very loaded question but in general when i see people bloated like they, this is what they'll tell me mr Kent. they say dr megan i eat and i feel like my food just sits in my stomach like a stone OK, when they say that or if I ask them that, then I pretty much know they're probably low in digestive enzymes. OK, now, guys, to break apart your food, you've got to remember digestion is the function of breaking your food from something really big that you can see like an apple to something microscopic like that, that like vitamin D. Right. You can't see vitamin D. OK, but that's the process of digestion. It starts in your mouth with your teeth. OK, now. So what's happening there is that, remember, in your mouth, you will have um, amylase, which is an enzyme. And if you're wondering, well, what the heck are enzymes? There, it's basically like a component that will make something that's already going to happen, happen faster, right? So for example, if I am, I love bananas, I want to peel bananas and eat them, obviously I could do it faster if I had like a big monkey in my room with me, peeling it with him, right? We all know monkeys like bananas too. So he's in there helping me peel it faster. So the monkey is what an enzyme would be. It's something that's going to make a process that is already destined to happen, but happen faster. So for example, in the mouth, you'll have amylase that helps you break down your carbohydrates, things like bread, rice, pasta, fruit, veggies. Those are all carbs, okay? Now, then when it gets down through your esophagus, which is your tube that takes your food to your stomach, okay? Once it gets down there, it'll be churned apart and broken apart by stomach acid, hydrochloric acid. Then it goes down to your small intestine, okay? Now, the enzymes that you need here, you're going to need enzymes to help you break up protein, things like, like meat, fish, you know, um, milk. Those things all have cheese. Those all have protein in them, okay? So then you'll need a protease. That's the name of that enzyme, protease. But then you'll also need an enzyme to help you break up fats, right? Those are called lipases, lipases. So then you get an, a kind of a conglomeration of all of these three enzymes in the intestine. So you got your amylases to break up your carbs, your proteases to break up your protein, and then your um, lipases to break up your fat. Now, when people are low in those enzymes, that food is now just going to sit in your intestines, guys, because you, you don't have the enzymes to break it apart. So they say just sit there. It's, they're like a stone. Eventually, it starts rotting, guys, rotting just like a bike that got wet in the rain can start rotting, right, or rusting. That is actually what we call oxidation medicine, okay? Rotting is oxidation. It starts rotting. As it rots, the bacteria kind of get on it. It produces gas, gas, methane, gas, CH3, okay? Now all this gas fills up in the stomach, right? Because this stomach is not an infinite space. So all this gas fills up like you swelling a balloon, uh, inflating a balloon. After a while, the balloon is going to get too big and pop. So that's basically what it is with the bloating. They usually have low digestive enzymes. 
Yeah, that that that's really interesting, and and the enzyme and amylase is something I have a conversation all about because obviously my my field is about carbohydrates and and people with low amylase they do have a little bit more difficulty digesting carbs. That that was so that's the reason why people um have this bloating in their stomach. And so here so here's another question around the stomach. But first, let me I forgot one more poop question which is really really important. No problem. How no problem. how how many day how many times a day should someone go poop? How have a poop? That's a great question. Optimally, guys, Mr. Ken, when we look at like people in Asian societies and Africans like the Maasai tribe for example in Africa, just people in general that don't have what we call the sad diet which is the standard american diet is sad like boo hoo right um people that don't have that diet eat good grains herbs everything okay they tend to poop after every meal so if they eat three times a day they should also poop three times a day and they shouldn't be pooping 2 hours 8 hours later i'm well not 8 hours later they should be pooping like at the max maybe 3 hours later give it enough time to go through the whole gi okay so after every meal guys that's optimal but obviously in western society in the uk and us australia no we are not pooping that much okay and so for us in our western societies i'd say at least once a day where it's well formed not hard not too soft well formed comes out easily in 5 minutes that's a reasonable poop anything more than 10 minutes and it's too hard too soft that's already constipation or diarrhea which is a bad sign I can't hear you, Mr. Ken. Okay, so here's another question. Uh, I, I, not so, I said, hopefully that will be the last poop question. So here's another question around the stomach. How does visual <laughs> fact affect your gut and the way your gut works? Because obviously people have their stomach and they have a big stomach, they have adipose tissue, which we know is the fluffy stuff. But the visceral fact is that hard stuff that that is around their organs. So how does someone with a uh, high visceral fat, does that have an extra effect on their gut yes. and the way their gut works? If you could explain that, please. Yes. And actually, guys, visceral fat is absolutely the worst. If you had to be fat somewhere, you try to make your arms fat or your legs fat. But visceral fat is horrible because that's where your GI is. Okay. So already does visceral fat affect your heart because your heart's trying to pump. pump Instead of like pumping you know, a nice fluid blood is pumping thick blood. So you can think of it like this in a real life. What would you rather suck up in a drinking straw? Water or honey? Okay, which one is gonna be hard? Honey, right? That's what your blood is like if you got too much fat. Your blood, your heart is pumping against that. But now how it affects the GI is that visceral fat, first of all, if there's too much of it, you, just don't, you decrease your blood flow, which is bad because digestion requires a lot of blood flow. Just like you can think of blood flow as like a hot commodity commodity guys like think of it like money how much money would you like to have a million dollars of course you would or would you like to have ten dollars and be like almost under a bridge that's what blood is guys it's a commodity so we need a lot of blood flow for digestion a lot of high visceral fat will decrease that blood flow which will mess up your digestion which will eventually give you some kind of disease the second thing it does is guys in the body fat is actually in real life like our jail, right? Where do we put criminals? In jail. We don't want them out on the street here beating us, raping us, killing us, okay? We put the criminals in jail. Where fat guys, that's where your body puts toxins or things that are like criminals. It puts them in the fat because we don't want them free and running, flowing in our blood vessels. So we put them in the fat because we can hold that. And hopefully, if you're a thin person, you don't have a lot of fat meaning you don't have a lot of places for it to store. But if you are heavy, that is a bad, bad thing. You have way too many toxins sitting around and staying there in your fat, which is very dangerous. That, the way you explain that. Tell me, does, you're talking about fat there, so it just leads me to a, a question um, regarding ghrelin and, and um, leptin. Does, um, when your stomach mess is, your gut biome is messed up, does that affect the delicate balance between ghrelin and leptin? It does, because they've actually done some studies again, where they've seen that people that overeat, meaning you're not eating because you're hungry, you're just eating because you want to eat, you like eating. I love eating too, guys, y'all know I love eating. But still, I don't overeat, because I know that, guys, you need to think of your stomach like muscles, okay? They are muscles. They have three muscles, um, vertical, horizontal, and longitudinal in the, in the stomach. So that's like straight, sideways, and then diagonal. 
right? So the fact is they are really muscles, just like your arm or leg muscles. So guys, would you want to be on a treadmill for like eight hours all day without no break? Would you want that? No. So why are you eating all day with your stomach? That's horrible. Eat, stop eating, no snacking, let it rest, and then you can eat again, okay? Otherwise, you're on the treadmill. So from 7 a.m., you eat that first breakfast, then you have a 9 a.m. snack, then you have an 11 a.m. brunch, and then you eat like like a snack in the afternoon at 3, then you have dinner at 5. Your stomach is working all day, not just the stomach, all of the organs, because they all have six organs, guys. Your GI is your your um, stomach, your small intestine, large intestine, your liver, the and then the pancreas. Now, those are all organs, but then you have three parts, too. You have the mouth, you have the esophagus, and then the gallbladder. So all that is on as soon as you even put a drop of water in your mouth, okay? So now, as far as he talked about with the ghrelin and leptin, guys, those are two enzymes that basically tell your brain, have I eaten enough? Or not? Am I still hungry? No. Okay. So the leptin is the the horn, the enzyme that tells you, um, yeah, I'm full. I've eaten enough. I think we can stop eating. Okay. That's the leptin. Now the ghrelin is the opposite. He's the one that says, I'm hungry. I'm hungry. Feed me more. Right. And that's the I, I think of ghrelin. So remember the two in med school? I thought ghrelin reminds me of gremlin. Right. So we don't like gremlins, do we? They're scary and they're mean. So I thought, okay, ghrelin, that's the evil one. So the leptin is a good one. <laughs> so hopefully you guys can remember like that. So yeah, if your gut microbiome is off, you actually do produce more ghrelin, meaning I'm hungry, feed me, feed me. Obviously, that can lead to obesity and other problems. Yeah, that was a. I can't hear you again, Mr. Ken. Can't hear me. So that was a great explanation about grenin and leptin. Uh, and especially the reason why I thought about leptin, because you mentioned the adipose tissue, and I know, I know that's where leptin comes from. But that's really good to, uh, for people to understand is that when their stomach is off, they, they eat more. And it causes yes. it causes a weight gain, which is it is never ever a good thing. So because you're mm -hmm. on about ghrelin and, and leptin, which is something I speak about often to my clients and anybody who wants to talk about uh, um, high carbohydrate, that there are two things I want to um, speak about. The first thing I want to speak about: how does sugar? Yes, we won't break it down. You know, how does excess sugar? affect your gut microbiome oh. oh it's horrible it's horrible go for guys. it you go god it's, it's horrible okay not only does sugar um cause things like brain fog and just make you just kind of it, it does brain fog that's one meaning what to do with my keys or what was i going to do okay secondly it will make your blood more clotted because anything sticky on the outside guys is also sticky on the inside so is honey sticky on the outside? Is sugar water sticky? Yes. Well, it's going to be sticky on the inside too. Now your poor heart, instead of pumping water around, is trying to pump around honey. Okay. That's it. Puts you at increased risk of stroke and heart attack. Okay. Now, the third thing it does, which I think is the most major, is that it slows, into, it slows down digestion. Meaning the more sugar that you have in your body, it will slow down everything. Your stomach, your liver, your kidneys, not sorry, not kidneys, your uh, small intestine, large intestine. And again, that's actually sugar is what I was referring to when I said it can slow down your immune system, remember? I said earlier it can slow it down four to six hours. So guys, again, think of take, giving the police, everybody knows it, everybody. We make an announcement on the news. Hey, the police have four to six hours off. Okay, sorry guys, defend yourselves as you can. Okay, that would be crazy. Y'all know they had a movie once that was like called Anarchy or Rising or some weird movie where basically it was a day where all the criminals are allowed to get out of jail and all the innocent people have to go in hiding because they're not going to be beaten, killed, raped. You know, they, they're they just roaming the streets literally in bands looking what harm they can do. Guys, this is what happens when you turn off your immune system, okay? Is that the same with um, fructose as well as well as glucose? Because we know that carbohydrates turn to, simple carbohydrates turn to glucose and, sh and fruit turns to fructose. Is that the same with excessive amount of fructose when your stomach is off? It is. And usually the main culprit these days have been the high fructose corn syrup. And, you know, they always try to put conflicting information in the media. But at the end of the day, guys, no, high fructose corn syrup is not good. It's like six times more concentrated than your regular fructose, which is a common fruit sugar. Yes, any fruit will have fructose. That's a common sugar in fruit. You can't eat a fruit that does not have fructose. But when you make high fructose corn syrup, that's a concentrated amount. So, guys, 
That's like instead of me eating an apple, I juice them and now I can drink 10 apples in a juice, right? That's very concentrated. So that's not good. Now your regular glucose is in all foods as well, especially carbohydrate foods, only carbohydrate foods. But um, so that's okay. But again, what I'm really talking about here is guys, alterated table sugar. I'm not talking as much, unless you have diabetes, but I'm not talking as much about natural sugars and fruits like apples, grapes, whatever, but I'm talking about table sugar and things like brownies, cake and cupcakes, stuff like that. Okay. Yeah, that's fantastic. So we're going to, cause we have, we've had a great conversation about the things that people can, 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 to, so they can realize their gut my cold brown is off. And we're going to be talking about some remedies. But I just a couple of more things I want to talk about of how important it is. Just tell me, how does someone's gut, my gut, affect their sleep? Because I know when you have, you know, gut issues, it sometimes affects their sleep and they can't sleep. So just enlighten us to how why that happens, please. Absolutely. Well, for one, okay, remember guys, you should really think of your body as like a little like a little country, like I say. So some parts of the country will be awake depending on the time zone, but others might be asleep or might be resting. So you should think of it that way. So basically at night, your GI should not be going. In fact, I stop eating around four or five in the day because I do start my nighttime routine at eight o'clock. So I do not want my stomach and my small intestines, everybody to still be up working. And you can think of that guys like you, you go to work and you work eight hours, right? So did you want your boss to come and see you at five o'clock and dump a huge bunch of files on your desk and say, hey, look at you, get overtime. You say, hey, I don't need overtime. I don't need the money. I wanna go home. He says, sorry, you gotta stay here and work. Well, do you think you'd be working under happy conditions or you'd be angry and grumbling? Well, that's what happens too, guys, when you eat too late. You're, you've probably already been eating all day. Well, if you have. And so then now you need to also remember too, that your stump, your body does have metabolism. That's like the energy of what it's doing, processing different things. And so you have higher metabolism in the morning and lower metabolism at night. So meaning you should be eating a lot in your heavy meals earlier in the day, your light meals like salad and fruit and stuff like that in the evening. Why? Because your body's getting ready to go to bed now. So what happens if you ate too late? First of all, your whole GI is still up and going when you should be sleeping. Now, they may not even work well because they're angry, right? And then on top of that, your organs have different times. So for example, um, your liver, remember all organs have an associated time that they're more active during the day. So the liver is actually the most active from 11 p.m. to 3 a.m. So for example, guys, I right now have temporary insomnia because my liver is off because all the medication stuff I had to take, right? And so that means I'm always waking up at midnight. I'm always waking up at one or at two or at three. And guys, I'm not falling right back asleep. I may stay awake for like an hour or two hours. One time I woke up at one and stayed awake till 9 p.m. the next night. I just could not go back to sleep. So guys, when you keep your GI up from eating too late, you will really disrupt your sleep. And on top of that, they said studies have shown that people that don't sleep well tend to overeat because again, not sleeping well will then stimulate your ghrelin production, which will tell you to eat. People don't usually eat healthy things like carrots. They're like driving like candy bars or whatever. And so they tend to put on weight. So guys, please don't eat late. It's horrible. You don't sleep well. You're cranky. You end up getting fired. Now you got to live under a bridge because you're poor. I mean, I'm saying, guys, please don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> you gotta live on your bridge because you're poor. Huh? I love you. I love you. I love your energy. Listen, guys, look, I have one more question for Doc, Dr. Megan. Okay. Well, I have a couple. As I'm putting it, listen, we have the chat here on YouTube or, or Facebook. If you have a question for Dr. Megan, please um put it in the chat let's see if we can get a couple of questions asked because we're, yeah. we i just wanted to take you through that journey to give you understanding of why gut health is incredibly important and i think dr megan's laid that out excellent in an excellent way mm -hmm. so if you have some questions don't be shy put them don't in the shy, chat guys. and let's see if we can get some of your questions answered so um before we move on to the ways we can heal our gut or or protect our gut i have one more question and that question is around serotonin and the reason why I'm asking about serotonin, because I know that about 90% of our serotonin happens in our gut, in our stomach. Uh, so is there, a correct, is there a connection between bad gut health, serotonin, and mental health? Absolutely. 
That is a great question. I'm glad you asked that question, Mr. Ken. Absolutely. Guys, please get your gut together because it can literally make you crazy. He's right. 90% of your serotonin is actually made in your gut. And then it is sent through your bloodstream to your brain. So a lot of times when people are like depressed or have anxiety or other things like that, they think it's a brain issue. They put you on antidepressants. They put you on all kinds of stuff which is silly. It's not a brain issue. It's a gut issue. And this is how much your gut can influence your mind, Mr. Ken. When I was in medical school, I was, I don't remember her name now. I don't, but originally she was a psychiatrist. Guys, that's a doctor that deals in mental health, a medical doctor. Okay. Regular doctor, mental health, things like a bipolar, depression, anxiety, things like that. Okay. ADD, that stuff. Okay. Now, anyway, she decided, but she got disillusioned with conventional medicine and she decided to become a naturopathic doctor. Now, remember, our training is identical to the, the medical doctors, but we do more. We do all the natural ways to help the body heal, like acupuncture, botanical medicine, clinical nutrition, environmental medicine, homeopathy, mind body medicine, physical medicine. So, each of those things, guys, has six classes behind it. So, that's really an additional two years besides the basic four. So really we're already doing six years of medicine, but they cram it into four. So in any case, she wanted to become a naturopathic doctor. So she only had to do the additional two years. Anyway, she so, started to, that oh, she decided sorry, you had, she wanted, what'd you say? I thought the pause meant you had finished. My apologies, you continue with oh, your no, saying. Oh no, no, I just, I'm almost done Mr. Kim. But I'm trying to make this point. No, it's okay. I'm trying to make this point about your gut health and mental health because I think you'll be astonished when you hear this. Okay, all of you. So she decided to do a little pilot study on her patients, right? Okay. So she decided to eliminate one thing from their diet and see how that would affect their mental health. She decided to pick her schizophrenic patients. You all know that schizophrenics have disordered thinking. They may hallucinate. They got all kinds of craziness. Can barely keep. The, they cannot keep their life together at all. Okay. Now. She took about 30 of them. She removed wheat, wheat from their diet, okay? She said in about three or four months, 20 to 25 of them had completely reverted to lucidity, meaning they were no longer schizophrenic. Guys, if you don't get your gut held together, it can literally make you crazy. Schizophrenia, guys, Google it if you don't know what it is. It's serious, okay? And the fact that she removed something like wheat from their diet and they become non-schizophrenic. To be honest, guys, I did not believe her. I knew I was in naturopathic medical school, but I was like, this lady is a quack, whatever. Until one of my classmates, Lupita, raised her hand and she said, yeah, I used to have suicidal thoughts, not because anything bad had happened to me, like no trauma, no nothing. I just, for some reason, really wanted to kill myself. I seriously wanted to do it. And she felt guilty because she was Catholic. Obviously, if you're Catholic, you're not supposed to be dreaming about killing yourself. She finally went to many doctors did not have any help and eventually ended up just cooking for herself only like beans and rice. She's from Mexico. So only like beans and rice, but no anything packaged. She said the suicide thought stopped. So by that point, guys, I was like 50% convinced. Okay. Maybe there is a connection between the gut and the mind. Okay. But then Michelle, another girl raised her hand. She said, I used to suffer from panic attacks. Okay. I'd be in a room and just literally feel like I have to start screaming and hiding and curl up into a ball in the corner of the room. After she removed, I think for her, she said it was corn, okay? After she removed that from her diet, no more panic attacks, okay? So by that time, Mr. Ken, I was obviously 100% sold on the connection between the gut and the brain. In fact, now in naturopathic medicine, we call the gut the second brain because they're so closely related. All of the patients that I know that have reflux disease, like GERD or something like that, they are always so anxious, anxious about everything, their money, their life everything okay so yes these diseases absolutely have a mental implication that, that's excellent look i can't hear you again i said that's excellent normally go until about three o'clock but we're going to go a little bit longer because i think you just have a, yep. a wealth of information and we're going to try and answer okay. some questions and i'm just going to try and guide you to allow people to have some um kind of natural ways we've got a question coming and it yeah. says look I have had a course of antibiotics and my gut is completely off. I don't Ugh. eat dairy. What can I do to get back to optimal gut health? That's a great question. Yeah, I hate antibiotics, guys. Don't get me wrong, I like medications. I think they have their place in urgent 
medication, meaning if it's like you have optic neuritis and you're about to go blind because you have an eye infection, yes, for God's sake, let's please take an antibiotic and I worry about detoxing you later, but I want you to go blind just because I want to give you an herb, you know? I like medications when they're used appropriately. They're wonderful, life-saving, okay? When they're misused, it will absolutely debilitate you beyond belief, okay? So now what you need to do, friend, after you took those antibiotics, you basically need to take a course of probiotics, okay? In general, guys, if you do have to take antibiotics, usually what I tell people is if you're going to take your antibiotics, well, they usually tell you to take it three times a day, right? But if you can, try to take probiotics in between there, like meaning you take the antibiotics at eight, then you take the probiotics at like 11. You're trying to just keep it somewhat populated because remember, guys, antibiotics are like a grenade. Y'all know what a grenade is, right? So what if, 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 you don't like the grenade just blows up everything in the area right so it's not like if i was standing there and i pull the pin the grenade is going to tell me oh megan was so nice you pulled my pin and set me free i'm not going to blow her up do they say that no a grenade blows up everything whether it's you your mom whatever whoever's in that radius you will get blown up that's what an antibiotic does it blows up all bacteria including your beneficial your bacteria not just the pathogenic ones so now you need to repopulate with probiotics the probiotic brand that i like is from um, Saroyal and it's called HMF intensive. And usually, this is not medical advice, right? But this is just education. But usually we suggest that people take 20 billion just to maintain, meaning a person who is not sick, no issues, 20 billion. So obviously if you've taken um, antibiotics, you definitely need more than that. I say you could even start at 40 billion, maybe at the most 60 billion daily, always take it with food. Um, Usually, well, not always with food, I say actually take it away from food because now you're trying to repopulate. Take it away from food. Pop- oh, sorry. I- that, that's okay. You're, you're, you're no, in demand. That's actually, yeah, I put on a, I put, that's actually my alarm. I have a board meeting at church at 10, but that's okay. We can go over a little bit. Um, the fact of the matter is, yes, take your probiotic at night, more than 20 billion, and away from food uh, to repopulate. We take it at night just because um, then it can sit on there all night to try to repopulate. Probably got to do that at least a good week or two because now you just wiped your whole system out. Could, I ain't could you just remind? The, could could you could you say in sixty minutes, six hundred minutes? Could you just remind them so they so when they look at the back, they know what they're counting. What do you mean that the millions? You're talking about six hundred million, sixty million. Right. What do you mean by right. that? That's a good question. Yes. So bacteria, there's a dot, lot of different strains of bacteria. Like there's Lactobacillus, Bifidobacteria. You know everything, right? So when you're looking at the back of the bottle. You're looking at first what different strains are there, but also see what is the quantity of those strains. And they usually will do that in IUs, uh, uh, CFUs units, but sometimes, uh, yeah, usually CFUs, colony forming units, okay? So when you're looking at how many are in there, that can give you an idea of how many are actually active, okay? So again, I said a normal dose for a regular not sick person would be 20 billion a day. So if you take an antibiotic, you minimum need to start at 40 billion. So as you're looking at the back of that bottle to see how many, if it says like 6 billion of that, 7 billion, that's obviously not high enough. I told you the minimum for healthy people is 20. So you need to get a better product. As far as the products go, um, usually you have to be a doctor to order my supplements. But now I do have, I do have a few, um, companies on my happy list that you can order from directly. Companies like Organics, companies like Dr. Newsom, companies like Global Healing, Well of Life. Okay, those are good companies you can order directly. And if you guys are interested in my happy list, Mr. Ken, I will send that to you, a link to it, so they can sign up for it. Guys, my happy list has all things GI on it, meaning your etiologies are the reasons you get sick. Things like low acid, low digestive enzyme. That's a cause, not just the name of the diagnosis. Okay, things like um, H. pylori infection. Okay, but I also have your your diagnosis, your specialty tests like low stomach acid. We can test for that. Low enzymes, your stool samples, Genova micronutrients, how many B vitamins you have. So we can test for all those things. So I will send that to you, okay, Mr. Ken, if they want that happen. No, no, okay? no, no. But we're, we're going to give out your contact details at the end of the show, and okay. people are going to reach directly out to you. You just got such a wealth mm-hmm. of information. I hope that answered um, their question. So here's here's a question. Um, some people are up. We, we want to talk about ways to keep our health healthy. What is your take on colonic irrigation? Uh, it's a question I have to ask. 
Good, good. I'm glad you did. And I really do like colonics. The reason we, what a colonic is, first of all, guys, you're using basically a system that's basically injecting water through your rectum. So it's going back up the opposite way. And the reason I like this is because it's kind of stimulating the body in a way that normally would not be stimulated. It also, because of the force of the water, it's not too strong. It's not uncomfortable, no pain. But the force of the water is dislodging things that maybe would not come off normally during a regular defecation or pooping, right? So I like it because of that, okay? You also need to make sure you're going to the appropriate um, type of system. They have an open and a closed, usually one to be closed, it's a closed system. And what that means is that we don't want poop to be getting back, you know, then pushing your poop water that is going out of your body back into your body. So when it's closed, it means it pulls it, like sucks it out, does not go back up. I do like colonic irrigation, but I don't like them to be too frequent. Why? Because just like the body is used to have it, it also gets lazy. If you're always giving it something exogenously, or meaning from the outside, that it should normally do or produce on the inside by itself, it's like, okay, I don't have to do this because she's going to give it to me, right? Just like welfare. You remember welfare back in the 80s or whenever? Why yeah. should I go to work all day, eight hours, if I can just have three kids and then they'll pay me to stay at home? Why would I do that, right? So exactly, we don't want the body to become lazy in anything that it should normally do. So colonics, I recommend really just maybe once a week if you want to do it that often, maybe once every two weeks just because you got backed up. Otherwise, I've noticed personally, when I've done them too often myself, I'm already prone to constipation, then my body really got lazy and I can no longer have a normal bowel movement without the colonic. Great, that's absolutely fantastic. So we spoke about probiotics, we spoke about colonic irrigation, food. So the normal everyday shopping list, what foods can people go out um, in their normal everyday shopping that might help protect their gut microbiome. Okay. So in general, I always tell people a plant strong diet is best. Okay. I'm not anti-meat. I'm not, well, I just did a test myself so I can no longer eat meat myself. I do eat fish, but I'm not against meat. If it's like an organic beef or like even bison, they still kind of ruminate, you know, cows that chew, you know, organic beef, bison, deer is a great thing a goat even. I don't know, I'm not crazy about chicken or poultry, chicken or turkey, because in general, the birds, the way they're raised now, very unhygienic, very just, they're sickly, they're just everything. So in general, I don't like them. And they also are not very high in iron and other micronutrients like the other red meats are. But with that being said, I don't think your meat intake should be so high. I would say you need to have maybe two ounces of meat. If you want to eat it every day, you don't need to eat it every day but maybe two ounces. And what is two ounces? Maybe the size of a kiwi or half a kiwi. Okay, I don't need you to eat a lot of meat, guys. Not a big steak. But apart from that, they could eat a diet that's high in dark green vegetables, meaning things like um, kale, spinach, broccoli, turnip greens, mustard greens, collard greens. Why? Because those things are high in fiber. It helps your pooping. But in addition, high in antioxidants, which are help fight what we call basically oxidation in the body. Remember guys, oxidation is like rusting. So your bite gets wet and you leave it out in the yard, it is gonna turn brown. We don't like that, okay? We don't like it in the body either. Oxidation leads to disease. So I like high those dark. I really want you to minimize things like potato, rice, corn. Those are okay, like maybe once or twice a week, but just minimize that. You don't need that, okay? Very high in starts leads you towards diabetes and other things, okay? Um, after that, as far as fruits go, I do like um, all the fruits that are very high, again, in antioxidants, flavonoids, those things that help your eyesight, stuff like that. So those would be the berries, guys. So things like blackberry, blueberry, raspberry, strawberry, anything with a berry. Okay, they're also low in glycemic index. So if you do have diabetes, then you don't have to worry about it spiking your blood sugar as much. Okay, avoid things like apple, banana, pears. Those are good in moderation, not really if you have diabetes usually, but... Those are good in moderation, but they also tend to be more starchy, not really out of fiber. Well, yeah, pears and apples do have fiber, but it's in the skin. So remember, you've got to eat those skin. Do not peel your apples and pears and stuff because you like the way the skin tastes because now you have no fiber. You just have carbs now. That's not good. Okay. But apart from that, I like also melons, not to be eaten with food because you, you don't just that well with food, but um, melons, papaya, pineapple. I love pineapple. It has bromelain in it, which is like if you have any scarring in your body from surgery or things like that, it can help decrease the scar. So I like that. Now nuts, I like nuts too. Um, nuts are great. They have both protein and fat. So you get that satiety, right? But 
um, make sure that you're eating raw nuts. I don't like roasted nuts. The high heat disturbs the uh, protein um, composition, which can actually become carcinogenic or causing cancer later on. Okay. So, and of the nuts, I do like all nuts, Brazil nuts, sesame, pecan, walnut, everything. But I don't really particularly care for either peanuts and also cashews. Why? Because they tend to harbor mold, aflatoxin, and that is a toxin in your body builds up and also causes disease. So please minimize or even eliminate those two nuts, okay? But I think we talked about the meats, the veggies, the fruits, the nuts. I do like oils as well. Don't like a lot of oil, but I like olive oil, um, jojoba oil, almond oil. Those are like your healthiest oils. So yes, your diet absolutely will influence your gut microbiome. Hey, so hey, so fantastic there. I mean, obviously we, we slightly differ on the amount of meat, but a plant-based diet for some people works really well for me. Um, my studies are with me, but we, but it's your floor today. So we won't go in there. No, so, here's no. the so we spoke, so we, said, uh, we yeah, spoke yeah. about food. How about drink? So what is your take on kombucha? I love kombucha. Kombucha is basically like a fermented drink and it's fermented in the sense that they've allowed it to kind of age. That's what fermenting is like wine guys. We don't use like new wine. We like our wines that are old for like years because they have the best taste, the best odor, the best quality. So that's what kombucha is. And what makes it ferment is that the bacteria, because they've aged, those bacteria are able to help you break down your food and break down different things, you know, in your body because of the aging. And I just like fermentation in general. Uh, things like kimchi, sauerkraut, those are also fermented foods. Yeah. Kimchi is I was Korean. about to ask you about fermented food as well. Yeah, I like that too. So I actually buy my kimchi. Um, I have some right now. I need to eat it today. Um, yeah, and sauerkraut is from the Germans. I don't really like sauerkraut. It's kind of like bland. But the kimchi that I get is great from the Koreans. Again, fermented foods is a nice natural way to get your probiotics if you don't want to buy them. Again, the thing with natural foods, though, is that you can't really be sure how much is in there. So, I mean, how much is really fermented in here? So that's why usually if people are really sick, I prefer to supplement, just make sure they get the minimum. Then after that, I try to wean them off into just getting it from their foods. I think we need a little bit of clarification when it comes to cashew nuts and peanuts, because some people in the chat, they're panicking. I love peanuts and they eat a lot. Let's just clarify this mold. Um, because, you know, and, 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 and when that mold comes in, you're not saying to people to stop. Are you saying to people they should never eat peanuts or you're saying, no, so please just clarify that because I see some people, they love their Sorry. cashew nuts <laughs> and they love their peanuts and they're thinking, oh, wow, I love it. So just clarify I this know. mold um, and when that kicks That's in me. and when it's a bad time to eat that peanut in, in relation to how your GI is. Yeah. Right. No, I didn't mean to scare y'all. I didn't mean to give y'all a complex, okay? No, you can't eat peanut butter and cashews. But what I'm saying is it should not really be a daily event. The aflatoxin that I'm telling you about, like I said, what that is, that can really cause a lot of problems in your GI, in your brain, just in your heart, everywhere, guys. So I don't need to eat a lot. With that being said, when you can eat it, you can eat it maybe two, three times a week still. I love peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, right? I grew up with that. I love it. And I know people from Nigeria, they use peanuts like um, in a different way. I can't remember. Is it boo boo or what's it called? But anyway, boo boo maybe. But anyway, they use it. So no, I'm not saying never. I'm saying it should not definitely not be a daily occurrence. Okay. And also though, the quality of the peanuts and cashews is important. It does play a factor. So if you're getting organic peanuts that have not been roasted, that are built, you know, uh, grown in the best region of wherever peanuts are grown, that is obviously making a big difference than just getting a bottle of Jif at the local store and thinking that's healthy. It's not. Please pay the extra $4 for good quality butter, okay, whether it's almond butter or whatever, okay? Now, with that being said, if you are sick, like you know you have, like that guy that was on antibiotics, or like you know your gut is off, then that's not the time to do it. Guys, that's like trying to hit a man when he's already down. Why are you going to try to hit me with a hammer? I'm already laying on the ground. Don't do that, okay? If you're sick, avoid it. But otherwise, yeah, it should be okay a few times a week. Sorry. <laughs> right now, that, that we needed that, cl that clarification yeah. there about about the um, the gut. So, he, so I, I suffer from this, and I must admit, I do suffer, and I'm trying to get better. Um, how about when you eat your food too fast? And I do suffer from that, I have to say. How about uh, that? Um, I, I you're speaking to me, and, and I'm sure you're speaking to a number of other people who are listening who live a very fast lifestyle and they eat their foods too fast. Um, how does that affect 
your gut and your great, gut balance. Great question. And like I said, Mr. Ken, you get a high five for honesty, okay? I put my hand. That's what I tell my patients. High five for honesty. You don't ever have to lie to me. I'm on your side. So I'll just tell you gently, okay, this is hurting you. But yeah, almost tell me what you're doing. Yeah, guys, when you eat too quickly, that's a very big problem. Like I said, digestion really starts in your mouth. And you have teeth for a reason, guys. There's no teeth in your stomach. You got to break down those big foods into something that's smaller that your intestines can develop, uh, uh, extract the nutrients they need, for example. So if you eat too quickly, one major thing happens. First, the food is way too big. Your stomach cannot break down huge food, has no teeth. Your intestines definitely don't have teeth, so they can't break it down. So now you're losing nutrients, okay? And you're making the system work harder, just trying to break it apart. So what's eventually gonna happen? You will get some kind of disease. Again, autoimmune, diabetes, whatever, doesn't matter, you're gonna get something. So this is what I try to remind you. If you set up your eating environment, that will help in the first place. So for example, what do I mean? An eating hygiene, meaning I'm not eating when I'm on the run, running out the house to get to work and I'm late. I'm not eating when I'm at work and the boss has just dumped 20 files on my desk and said, get this done right now. I am not eating when I'm stressed out and scared because a rabid dog is chasing me down the street, nipping at my bottom. No, you don't eat during those times, guys. Why? Because we do have two systems in the in our in our body. You have what we call the sympathetic system, which is the fight and flight, right? That's that rabid dog chasing me. I'm not thinking about eating when I'm being chased by a rabid dog nipping at my bum. Okay. Then there's a parasympathetic system. That's the rest and relax. That's when my le my legs are up on my table. I'm at home after work. I'm watching TV, just relaxing. Now, if you're trying to eat in the sympathetic system, those are diametrically opposed. So you're never going to digest your food well. It's going to be indigestion, bloating, gas. Never eat like that, guys. Only plan your meal time. Plan them. Plan. Okay? So I eat only when I'm relaxed, when I'm okay. So in the morning and, and, and have a routine, too. Your body likes routine. So don't eat anytime you feel like it. Have a routine around 8 to 10, 7 to 10, whatever. But have a range. Don't go outside of that, okay? Now, once you do that, then um, you pick that breakfast. You should not be working while you're eating breakfast. No working, not through video chat, not looking at the news. This should also be a very nice environment. You can look at happy things, you can listen to happy music, you can be talking to your family, whatever. This is a happy, quiet, relaxing time, not a time to be stressed out. Okay, you eat, stop eating and finish it, okay? Then that, so that will help you. Also try to plan what you're gonna eat. You're gonna eat fruit, you're gonna eat vegetables. What are you gonna eat so that you're not just grabbing anything that's available, okay? And then also just be thankful while you're eating. Guys, there's people starving all over the world right now. So they've not eaten in days, dying. So we should be happy, be thankful and happy to the food itself. It is alive before you killed it. So it was alive. Be thankful. Yes. Yeah, absolutely wonderful. I mean, and you're, you're speaking to me. I have to say, I don't know who else you were speaking okay. to, on this, <laughs> but you were definitely speaking to me. And I, I have to take that, that on board because I, you know, I do often eat a little bit quicker. Uh, some people may, might say very fast, but hey, I can in the scratch shout. No, you eat very fast. But no, it's a little bit quick. We have a couple more questions because I want to sure. respect your time and everyone's time. Um, the, the, the first question is, what is the impact of coconut oil on your gut health? Yeah, coconut oil is okay. It's actually one of the nicer oils. Um, it's full of like monounsaturated fats. So basically those are helping you with the cell membranes. So remember guys, all of your cells have a shape just like you have a shape and in general is um the outer layer is what we call the phospholipid bilayer and you've got to have a very good bilayer because that's like a door guys a door to your house that's what's determining who's coming in and who's coming out so if your door is always open that's not good right in the middle of the night you don't want burglars just walking in the house but it shouldn't be closed when you want to get out of the house either now you got to climb out the window okay so that phospho bilipid layer is very important to keep that sturdy and tight and the coconut oil will help you do that now, you don't want to be excessive because it is straight fat. It's the only thing that's 100% fat is oils. But so too much of that is not good. But yes, in general, very healthy for that. Great stuff. So listen, look, we're going to come start and come. I, I, I want to think about a few tips, you know, three three main tips that you can give people um, to use to be able to help maintain their gut and whether it's the probiotics, whether it's the food, whether it's some, something you haven't mentioned. But just to recap, look, in our poop talk, 
And we had our poop <laughs> talk. We spoke about how poop is incredibly important and that people should always um, look at their poop and examine it because that tells them so much. That's correct. Yes. It does. We spoke about the stomach and how uh, and we also talk about the smell, but we also talk about someone's stomach if it's bloated. That's also a sign. And also if they're, if they're fluffing, you call it, is it fluffy or whatever you call I it? Like you know, they I fart. like fluffing. They fart. Yeah, let's, like let's be real. <laughs> let's just be real on this show. If they're farting and it smells <laughs> like death, all right, there's a problem, you know? You don't have to call 999, but go yeah. and find yeah. out. So we've said that's also a sign that possibly people who are having insomnia could be a sign that their gut health is off again because obviously it leads to serotonin and everything else it is happening and you know we also spoke about how stress can induce you know a bad environment in your stomach and you spoke about it um a number of times you had you had a great answer for someone with antibiotics and how to uh, deal with antibiotics with probiotics so i've just kind of given a few summary of of what we spoke about yeah and then you also spoke about how colons you like colons how colons can be a great way to relieve your stomach uh, you also you also spoke about how you know having and i love the saying uh, eating hygiene because i speak about sleep hygiene i love that saying i'm gonna try and adopt that at eating yeah. hygiene she said it's a great way you spoke about the different foods that people should eat you know the fruits and you you spoke about the nuts but you also clarified the nuts and you also said kombucha is because it's a fermented drink, it's a great drink. And also fermented foods in itself are yes. great for the stomach. So I'm just really paraphrasing some of the things yeah. that you said, all right? So as we're coming to the close of the show, hit me with hit me and the audience with three solid things you would like them to leave this show with, all right? Okay. Three solid the things. First thing, three things. Okay, that's hard because I got a lot of opinions. I know, okay. I know, but just keep it free <laughs> for the time, okay? Yeah, all right. Well Y'all know I could talk all day. Now, look, the first thing, uh, Mr. Ken and everybody, um, I don't think I mentioned the castor oil cloth on this, and I love castor oil. Like I said, topically, it is a um, circulatory stimulant, meaning moving your blood, blood around. Secondly, it's um, an analgesic, meaning decreasing pain. So even for that guy that had the antibiotic use, I suggest that you could do this castor oil cloth application. Just get a regular washcloth that you have in your shower, drench that in like a cereal bowl, with castor oil, okay? I mean, drench it. it. should be almost dripping. Then you put that on your stomach. You can saran wrap it to your body if you're skinny enough to keep it in place. Put a towel down on your bed to protect your bedding. You're going to sleep overnight with this. And I love it because castor oil, like I said, it's a mover and shaker. Get your blood moving, okay? That's number one. The third, second thing is really, we didn't talk about it a lot, but water, guys. You've got to drink enough water for your body type and I mean your body weight. So... If I'm like five foot two and I weigh 90 pounds, I can't just be drinking a gallon of water, right? I'm just going to dilute my system. But if I'm like six foot 10 and weigh 300 pounds, I can't just be drinking eight cups of water because that's too little, okay? So half of your body weight. So if you weigh 200 pounds, then you need to drink 100 ounces of water. And if you're wondering how many cups an uh, uh, is in a, how many ounces is in a cup, Eight ounces is a standard cup size. Otherwise, you might be using a big cup and I'm using a small cup. So no, eight ounces. So eight, that 100, so we said 100 divided by eight, that would make it however many, 10 cups or whatever that math. Y'all know I'm bad at math. Anyway, so that would be that. Now my third thing, what do I want to say? I could say so many things, but I'll just say this since I'm thinking about it. Guys, this is not exactly gut related. But I, I've really been thinking a lot about positive affirmations right now. I think it's very important to always be positive about your health. You're going to have ups and downs, days where you don't feel good, days where you feel horrible, and then days where it's great, it's euphoria. So I really need you to say something positive about your health, and I need you to say it in the present. Things like, I am healing now because I'm making good choices, you know, something like that. So that every time you have a negative thought, remember what I said about negative thoughts and anger and stuff. It will depress your immune system, depress your GI. So we want to curb that by having a quick comeback with a positive affirmation. That's absolutely um, fantastic there. We did have a question about um, coconut oil with dementia we won't, and Alzheimer's. We won't really go into that. But what I will say is that the story you spoke about, the woman who healed because of wheat, it was because she stopped taking gluten. There's so much studies out there about how gluten affects dementia, 
and Alzheimer's. And that's the great thing about being on a low carb diet. You are not eating gluten. Listen, I know we could talk for ages. You can definitely talk for ages. I know that because I've spoken to you. Absolutely. Listen, this has been phenomenal. Gone in a little bit longer than I normally would. But I appreciate you. You are like a, a wealth of knowledge and your energy is so endearing. I absolutely love it. We are going to do this again and we're going to work together. Yeah. Again. I know there are some people who may want to reach out for you to find, to get that happy list. So yes. let the audience know how they can reach you if they want to, mm. you know, work with you. Cause you do have some gut, um, um, some gut programs and, yeah, and detoxing do. programs and X, Y, Z. I was even going to ask you about fasting, but we'll leave fasting for another time possibly. Okay. <laughs> question. But just share with the audience how they can reach you if they want to find out a little bit more about your services and connect with you. Sure, sure, guy. I would be happy to work with any of you. Actually, I'd be honored. It's an honor for me. I remember when I was in Cuba, a doctor did tell me that. I said, thank you, doctor. And he said, it's my honor to serve you. And I just thought that was a beautiful thing. I'd never heard a doctor tell me it was an honor to serve me. And he, I looked, I could tell he meant it. And I mean it too, guys. I'd really be happy to work with you. I do have a new group program starting tomorrow. And it's actually got a pandemic special, which is basically, you do need $120 U.S., to um, do the plan. Um, so in your country, I'm not sure how much that would be. But afterwards, you just pay me what you can afford, okay? Because I could set a price, but I do a survey, people can afford it. So I'll offer that to you. It's special, not to everybody, because just because you're listening to Mr. Kim. So that means get your 120, and then after that, one girl pay me 350, another girl pay me 15, okay? Whatever you say you honestly can afford, we can go for that, okay? And um, even if you can't start this week, maybe by next week, that's okay too, okay? Now, as far as how to reach me, you can always reach me through my website, member health organizers, healthorganizers.net, okay? Health, www.healthorganizers.net. Why health organizers? Because I'm working with you to tidy up your health naturally. <laughs> I thought that was very clever, guys. Okay, now, if you don't want to do it through health organizers, that's the best way. And you can hopefully remember that, healthorganizers.net. But if you don't want to do it that way, I am on Instagram now. And I think my name on Instagram might be. Is Actually, it I don't even know what. I think I think it's health organizers. I think it is health organizers. Yeah, on, on let's Instagram. just do that because I don't even know what the other thing is. <laughs> you yeah, okay? We can do health organizers, guy. Yeah, health organizers. And, and what I'll do is I'll actually put your details in on because this is broadcast live on Facebook. So I put your details in the, once this is finished, I'll put your details there and on the YouTube, because I'm sure there's some people who want to reach out for you. And this program mm. you're, you're starting tomorrow, it's not too late for anyone to join if they wanted to join. It's it, not know? too late. And look, even, because one guy even told me um, he wanted to start, but could not start tomorrow, but he wants to start next week. So even if you guys want to start by next week, I recommend if you can't start tomorrow, let's do it tomorrow. But I'm not sure which countries you're in, what your time zones are. So if I do have to set up a different group for like people that are like yeah. not in the US, then I can do that too. And we can start another like right. next week. No big Wonderful. deal. No big deal. Wonderful. Listen, Dr. Mickey, you you have been awesome. I mean, I, was, I said I was really excited about this. Not for your knowledge, but your energy and yeah. your <laughs> overcoming adversity. And yes. I just absolutely love this. And I and I feel energized. I really want to thank you on behalf of everybody You're who's welcome. watched today, not just for the information you shared, but the energy you brought. And, you know, and yes, and I know people have been really, really, really pleased with the information. That I'm you've glad. Shared. So really, really thank you from the bottom of my heart. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and we met, we met on an app called Clubhouse, everybody. We did, we did. Clubhouse is a phenomenal app. If anybody wants to connect with me there, you can search for me on Clubhouse, Ken Barnes. But we met on Clubhouse, and this is where Clubhouse is forming communities around the world and this stuff. So it's absolutely wonderful. So, Dr. Ming, I'm just going to close up the show quickly. Please just wait in the green room. Don't go anywhere, and I will come, and we will have a chat just after the show. Okay, right? no problem. I'll wait. So on behalf Bye, of everybody, guys. I'll be thank happy you to hear very from much. You. Thank you very much, Dr. Megan. Absolutely. So listen, guys, that's the show today. Um, I just would like to say to you, um, I have my tribe community and I've now opened up the community side of it. And what I mean by the community side of it is it was part of the program. I'm giving it away free at the moment. So if you go to this link here, b.link tribe free, 
you will be able to sign up for my community app to free. It's not Facebook. It's a dedicated platform that I've been using to support people, but I have now opened that platform up because I just want to build a community of people who are interested in, obviously in low carb, sugar, nutrition, exercise and sleep, but primarily sugar reduction. So you can go there and you can join up free. It's a place where you can ask questions. Oh, there's so much, it's a fantastic platform. And I just hope to build a community of people. So especially if you want to lose weight or reverse your pre-diabetes, this is a place there's where we can go and just share a common interest. So that has just been opened up today. And the platform was closed for a couple of weeks, but I've just opened it back up today. So go to that link there and you can join that community absolutely free. And you know, it, it you can say it's very similar to a Facebook group where you share recipes, share com, but it's so nice to be in the company of people who are on the same journey as you. So I'll talk a little bit more about that in the future. Just wanna say thank you very much again um, to Dr. Megan. At the beginning of the show, I normally thank my previous guests. I just wanna say thank you to Fitz because Fitz was awesome last week. I mean, I had so many positive comments about Fitz. So thank you very much, Fitz. I should have said thank you to you in the beginning for your wonderful show and your information last week. And you no, know, people really benefit from that. So thank you. Thank you, um, Dr. Megan, for being part of the show. Next week, we'll be back again with a wonderful guest. We've got a couple of options with some great information. I really hope that you are enjoying the show. We've moved it to a Sunday from a Monday. I hope we have international guests. We have people in South Africa, USA. So this is an international show. I can say I've got an international show now. Yeah, I've got an international show, an international show. I've also got clients in America and Jamaica, so I can say I'm an international co International, yes, the little guy from Hackney. But anyway, listen, all I wanna say is, listen, thank you very, very much for joining today. If you're watching this on YouTube, just like this video. It's nice to get a little like and subscribe because that way you will be notified whenever we are having um, one of these sessions and some other things. Just subscribe to the channel. Like this video, Dr. Megan will like that as well, if you like the video. And if you're watching this on Facebook, share the video, share this information. Same if you're watching on YouTube. Don't keep it to yourself, because I think we heard some really, oh, I hear we've got Canada. Dwayne, Dane is from Canada, look at that. So wonderful, thank you very much. So share this information, subscribe to the channel, like the video, share the video and everything, and just generally share the love. Listen. Guys, it's been absolutely real today. I mean, I've absolutely loved the show. Thank you very much for spending your Sunday morning or Sunday afternoon with myself and Dr. Megan. And as I always like to say to you, listen, of all the habits you can develop in your life, the best habit you can develop is to make health your habit. Bye for now, guys. Thanks for listening to the Make Health Your Habit podcast live show. Remember, the views and opinions expressed during the show represent those of our guests and host alone. We hope you enjoyed the show.